Can you see into my heart like open doors? Wave me up inside! Wave me up inside! Come on, David, sit with me! Welcome back to the Retro Room, everyone, and I know what you might be thinking. Am I about to talk about the notorious cancelled Daredevil game for the PS2 that we never got? Well, although that is a super interesting story, there's already been plenty of coverage on it. Instead, I want to talk about the Daredevil game that did get released to the public. Daredevil for the Game Boy Advance. Wait, hear me out. The GBA was loaded with literally hundreds of licensed adaptation games. Drake and Josh, Bionicle, Avatar The Last Airbender. Bionicle. Movie Batman, Cartoon Batman, Bionicle, Pirates of the Caribbean, is Spy Muppets licensed to croak. It seemed at the time like if it was popular, there was a Game Boy Advance game for it. So of course, Sony saw that and demanded their Daredevil movie get a game too. Since I'm assuming it was so easy to make these side-scroller beat-em-ups, it was obliged. Here's where things get interesting though. Daredevil for the Game Boy Advance isn't an adaptation of the movie. It's a sequel to it. Yeah, this game has a story that is standalone and takes place after the movie, can be consumed entirely on its own, and the best part, it's actually good. Yeah, I like the story of Daredevil for the Game Boy Advance, which is not a sentence I ever expected to utter in this timeline. It's got Kingpin doing shady things to try and mess with Matt, it's got tension between Matt and Elektra, we get to fight Bullseye again, it has a built-in function for Matt to use his senses to find things, characters from the comics like Echo make cameos, it's even got a sewer level, which I know Civvy would love. It's all just honestly kind of cool. Booting up the game, we're off to a good start. The color red saturates everything and the opening is moody. I love it. Getting to the menu, we get that movie logo and a handful of options, but let's get into the game and figure out what the hell the story of this even is. First thing we get is an opening montage of scenes from the movie to recap and set up the events of the game itself. Following that, the game actually opens with Matt talking to Stick, his instructor. Stick tells Matt that Kingpin has just met with Elektra at his penthouse, so Matt elects to go find her and discover why she was there. Then we get our first mission, set in the dark streets of New York, and what is that? Okay, that's an odd avatar, but ignoring that, we cut through these thugs and I admittedly enjoy the layout of this level. The design and aesthetic is pretty cool. We catch up to Elektra who accuses Matt of selling out before he then tells her he didn't sell out and that she was the one who went to visit Kingpin. She claims she only met with him to turn down his deal and that Matt is going to wish he did too. Matt, however, has no idea what she's talking about. The pursuit continues. The next stage actually has us fighting thugs on the rooftops. It's really cool. Feels like we're playing a real Daredevil game, dated as it might appear. This level also introduces a mechanic that has Matt able to jump from ledges. I enjoyed this touch. We catch back up to Elektra, who again begins talking to Matt about something he's clearly in the dark about, saying he must have really needed the money. This third stage has us jumping atop moving cars, fighting Kingpin's goons as we hop from car to car. I gotta admire the creativity on this one. It's a very clever level, and it's cool in my head to imagine Daredevil hopping from car to car as he fights these thugs. Next stage, we finally corner Elektra, and she immediately engages into combat with us, giving us our first boss battle of the game. It's a bit finicky to control, but it's not insane or anything. A decent first boss battle, I think. When she finally loses, she pretends not to know why they're fighting, so Matt reminds her that she believes he's working with the Kingpin. She tells him that the Kingpin is going to claim he's paying Daredevil for every criminal he defeats, but then obviously won't actually be giving him any money. Matt is doubtful of this claim, not fully understanding what she's saying, but upon pressing the matter, she retracts and doesn't want to talk anymore. What I really love about this is that it's exactly the kind of thing Kingpin would actually do. You'll see what I mean later. We then see Matt and Foggy in their law office as the radio announces that Fisk has taken public credit for paying Daredevil to dispatch the group of thugs he just cleared out. Foggy asks Matt what his thoughts are on the vigilante accepting payment for what he does, and Matt tries to play it cool but suggests he finds it unusual. After that, the radio announces that Daredevil has been invited to a face-to-face -face confrontation at the docks from an anonymous source. Matt surmises this to be Kirigi from the Ninjas of the Hand. 
Kirigi confronts Matt on the docks about his supposedly accepting payment from Kingpin, to which Matt of course denies. This results in the next few stages being a brawl against the ninjas of the hand to prove he has not partnered with Kingpin. The first of these is still on the docks, with the second stage taking place on a barge as we continue to fight the hand. Finally crossing over, we end up on a bridge fighting our way across a series of thugs and ninjas in broad daylight. Cars pass by us, and we can even see the city in the background. At the end of this bridge, we finally confront Kirigi who claims he now believes our innocence and laments that he must now kill Daredevil. Matt happily obliges as the two battle it out in our second boss battle of the game. Kirigi is fast, but once you figure out his patterns, you can beat him pretty easily. After we beat him, he vanishes, and Stick appears next to us to inform us we're not done yet. The sewer people, that's what they're called, now believe Kingpin is coming after them and sending Daredevil to attack them, so they respond in force by trying to expand out into the city, which Matt obviously has to put a stop to, ironically causing them to manifest what they were worried about. What follows are some of the worst stages in the game. Matt heads to a dilapidated warehouse full of junkies and thugs who believe Daredevil is here to take them down on Kingpin's payroll, which of course we do end up carving through the criminals in standard superhero fashion. At least, that is the idea, because in reality, I was getting slaughtered by this level, playing it repeatedly in an attempt to beat it, which of course after doing, we head down into the obligatory sewer level. Insert obligatory civvy reference. Even though this level is far more of a labyrinth, it's actually not nearly as unplayable as the last level. I even kind of enjoyed the design they had going on here. There's a fair bit of this aesthetic comprising several levels of the game specifically for these sewer missions until we encounter King i.e. King of the Sewers, a very minor character who leads the sewer people. Believe it or not, he is a real character from the comics, but he's barely known and only shows up in a handful of issues actually, so it's kind of cool that he's even here. The boss fight itself is easy, you just wait for his tell and whack him until he's out. Daredevil takes him down and heads back to the law firm with Foggy. There we can see the radio talking about Fisk's payments to Daredevil affecting his public perception as a hero. It then reports on a young woman vaulting obstacles down by the subway demanding to see Daredevil, which causes Matt to make an excuse and rush there straight away. Here we encounter another cool character brought in from the comics, Echo. This does make sense given she served as a supporting character for Daredevil in her inception and was a relatively new creation when the game was being made. Matt being blind and Echo being deaf makes for a very weird combo of heroes here. She calls out Matt for his supposed service to Kingpin, which he of course denies. She then bails out and leaves Matt to chase after her, taking down a small army of thugs between she and him. These levels are far better than the preceding sewer levels. The subway look feels way more like playing a daredevil game, and although most of the stages have hazards, the moving trains on this level are probably my favorite. We even get to fight on top of moving trains as we chase her down, and it's genuinely pretty awesome. Now's a good time to talk about the combat. It's super simple, but effective. Matt has a jump attack, punch kick combo by hitting B, and he can hit thugs with his baton using the right trigger. The left trigger of course activates his special ability, allowing him to sense things. Sometimes when I use the baton button, he throws it, other times he doesn't. I think this has to do with the power-ups we can find around the map, but I'm not sure. Speaking of, the power-ups are mildly helpful but mostly useless. There's one that makes you invincible temporarily and turns your suit silver while you fight. It's the most useful one by far. These daredevil coins are collectibles that you can collect across each stage. And if you collect them all, you unlock a handful of secrets ranging from concept art to screenshots of the movie. The best secret unlocks, however, are the alternate costumes. If you unlock all the secrets in the game, you unlock classic comic book costumes for Daredevil, Kingpin, Elektra, and Bullseye. More on that momentarily. Eventually, we catch up to Echo herself and face off in our next boss battle. She informs Matt that she plans to defeat him and use his costume to take down the Kingpin's bounties herself to collect the money. Matt is, of course, not very fond of the idea, so they begin fighting. This is such a clever idea too, because we're fighting on top of a train and occasionally we pass through these tunnels where we can't see anything. When that happens, we have to use Matt's vision to see and fight back because like Matt, Echo doesn't need her eyes to see. I love that they found a way to integrate the Daredevil vision into the actual gameplay like this and with such a cool comic book like set piece. After defeating Echo, she strangely disappears and Stick is just there on the train 
telling Matt that Bullseye is waiting for him in the construction yard to have a showdown, which is more than a little strange since I'm pretty sure we see him die in the movie, which is supposed to take place before this. All that brings me back to what I was saying before about the classic costumes you can unlock for the characters. This game is technically a sequel to the 2003 Daredevil film, but it doesn't feel like it, and in many ways isn't written like it. In fact, it feels way more like a game ripped straight out of the comics with merchandising from the movie to try to sell it more. With that in mind, I think this game can be enjoyed far more by playing it with all of the classic costumes enabled. Unfortunately, you have to complete the game and collect all the tokens and everything to do so which defeats the point. So what you're gonna wanna do is access the password screen from the main menu and enter this code right here, and it unlocks everything. Then just play it from the beginning like that. It's way cooler that way. Just see the bullseye comparison. For the rest of the video, it will be played this way. Back to the story, Daredevil arrives at the construction yard and confronts Bullseye there. He asks Matt how much Kingpin is offering him, to which Matt reveals the truth that Kingpin is lying to everyone about the supposed bounties. And for the first time, someone actually believes Matt up front. Except Bullseye thinks that maybe if he takes Daredevil out, Kingpin will pay him for it. Except Bullseye informs Matt that the construction yard they're at is run by the Yakuza gang members, and that he'll let them take a stab at killing Daredevil first, and then take credit if they succeed. To which we embark on the third act and try to take out a whole construction yard's worth of gangsters. Again, this is a great set piece, really puts the sewer levels to shame. The sunset New York skyline, the different equipment we climb over and fight atop, like battling thugs on top of an unfinished New York high rise is such a great penultimate setting for a Daredevil game. And now that we're in the classic costumes, I'm just pretending this is an adaptation of the comics now. Swinging from crane hooks as we see the sky get darker every level makes this whole arena just feel colorful and alive. Near the top of the building, we find Bullseye hiding out. The two have a brief conversation about Daredevil having cut through all those Yakuza and then face off. The battle isn't that difficult, but it's a little fun penultimate boss. Following his victory over Bullseye, Daredevil speaks out loud that this problem isn't going to stop until he goes and confronts Kingpin directly. We have reached the end of the line, and this is the final level before we face Wilson Fisk. We have to climb floor by floor, facing off against dozens of Yakuza and Kingpin's hired thugs. What's even better is that this is technically just a really long hallway scene. Yeah, yeah, I know. Look, I only used She-Hulk because he wears the yellow suit like in the game. Anyway, after fighting our way through eight floors worth of goons, we finally have our final showdown. Kingpin basically tells us that even though Daredevil isn't actually working for him, he still helped push Kingpin's interest by taking out his competition, to which Matt responds by beating the hell out of Fisk until he agrees to publicly deny ever having paid Daredevil anything. And this boss fight sucks. It's the hardest in the game for sure. First he summons these drones that you have to take down, and then the fight against him is insane. He can hit you pretty much anytime you're near him, and the only way to land a hit on him is to jump dive kick him specifically on his head. Anything else and the hit doesn't land, meaning he takes no damage. I had to grind at this particular battle for a solid few minutes, but eventually, I beat it. Kingpin agrees to publicly declare Daredevil was not on his payroll, but makes sure to inform Matt that this is a minor inconvenience to his overall plans. And lastly, we see Matt and Foggy in their office one final time as the radio announces that Fisk declared the Daredevil bounties the result of a rumor caused by an accounting error. With that arc resolved, the game ends and the credits roll. So the big question, do I think this game is worth trying for yourself? And the answer is, probably not. I do think it's fun and I enjoyed my time with it, but outside of the novelty of playing as Daredevil, there is very little this game has to offer. The gameplay does work, and it definitely shows ingenuity on the developer's part, but it tends to be repetitive. And as far as GBA games go, there's probably better titles to spend your time with. So unless you're like a Daredevil superfan, I'm recommending we leave this one on the Retro Room shelf. 
Thanks so much everybody for watching. I love that these videos give me the opportunity to go through these old games and talk about them with you all. Drop a comment with some of the older games you'd love to see featured on the Retro Room next. If you haven't yet, consider liking the video as that does actually really help with the algorithm, and of course, subscribe to keep up with what I'm doing next. Members of the channel get in on weekly updates, monthly live streams, exclusive polls, early content, and more. So consider hopping in on that if you're wanting deeper interaction with me here on the channel. Thanks again everyone for watching, I hope to see you in the next video, but until then, that's all I've got for you. Wake me up inside! Wake me up!